It's wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. God is so wonderful here tonight. I think it's appropriate that we pray for those that are sick and those that are out. Amen. Praise God. If you know of anybody that is sick, why don't you just lift your hands up. Amen. Tonight, let's lift up our voice to the Lord. God, we love you tonight. God, we thank you for everything you've done. God, everything you're doing. God, pray tonight, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that your hand would go upon each and every heart, Lord, every person that is sick, Lord, every person that needs your healing, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your healing virtue would flow upon their body, God. We're nothing without you tonight. God, we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Continue to worship with us. Amen. He is a holy God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
the righteous son of god he is the first and last the great i am the work has just begun he is the king of zion judah's lion the prince of peace is he alpha and omega Hallelujah, to worship him. God, you are holy, you are holy, you are holy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. I believe God is going to touch someone tonight. You may return to your seats. We want to give unto the Lord here in this place. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He has given so much of us, given so much to us. We should give back to him. Amen. Let's say this offering blessing together. Upon the authority of your word, we have given, and it shall be given unto us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We are tithers, and we give our tithes and offerings. We bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. We live under an open heaven. You pour out upon us such a blessing, there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, our whole family saved and walking with God, Perfect health and divine favor and blessing. We are blessed going in. We are blessed going out. All we do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Let's give unto the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I like that song. Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to find out who we are, find out what we want, where we want to go, what we want to do. We get lost in the world. 
Amen. But when we really find ourselves is when we find ourselves here at an altar, when God calls us to be what we truly are supposed to be, amen, then our path will really be laid out. Then what God wants us to do will really be laid out. Amen. Let's worship the Lord in one more song before we hear some preaching tonight. As I wait upon the Lord, I grow stronger. As I wait upon the Lord, I grow stronger. As I wait upon you, Lord, I grow stronger every day. As I wait upon the Lord, I grow stronger. As I wait upon the Lord, I grow stronger. As I wait upon you, Lord, I grow stronger. Amen. The kids are dismissed to class tonight. our hands to the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give God one more hand clap of praise. He's worthy of it. Amen, 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 amen. What a mighty God we serve. Isn't God good? I said, isn't God good? And all the time, amen. I feel good tonight. And I appreciate the musicians helping us. Why don't we give them a hand for helping us tonight? Thank you so very, very much. It's good to be here. I feel good about what God's doing. And I know there's a lot of people that are sick, and I've told them if they are exhibiting symptoms to stay home, it's fine. Uh, thank you, Brother Greg, for making sure that it's been on YouTube. And appreciate that. And it'll be on YouTube again tonight. And we appreciate that very much. It's good to have the Leopens back home on their trip. Amen. We missed them. Amen. It's good to see Brother Joe, Brother Joe back here traveling. Good. God bless you, my friend. Amen. My brother Tom, what did I say Joe for? Brother Tom, good to have you back in town. Always, always welcome. Anytime, stop by. Amen. It's good to be in church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to Exodus chapter 11. I want to jump right into what God has spoke to me about today. And I, I am truly excited about this. I have... Uh, I feel really good about what the Lord has shown me today and spoke to me about today. And I want to help the church, even those that are going to be watching this uh, later on on YouTube. I want to speak to you tonight as well. I want to help you tonight as well. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 11, 
verse number 6 and verse number 7. I really believe if we could grab a hold of what I want to talk about tonight, I believe God's going to bless this church. I already know he's going to bless this church, but I believe that you can be a part of that blessing, and you can be a part of enjoying the fruits of that blessing. Somebody say amen. amen. Exodus chapter 11, verse number 6 says, And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Amen. I want to preach tonight. There is a difference. There is a difference. Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We ask God that you would just move and bless, lift up, and make alive. Lord, move on each heart, each mind tonight. Those that are here in the tent and those that will be watching this later, that they too will receive what you have for the church. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. To set the stage for what I would like to speak on tonight, I would like to share a story that I heard. This was a true story. A young couple had saved their money. They had been married for five years. When they first got married, were not able to afford a nice honeymoon. But they had saved their money. And finally, they paid to go on a nice cruise. It was a 14-day cruise. Now, the date came for them to take the cruise, but the week of the cruise, their air conditioning in their home quit working. And so they had to take some money that they had set aside to pay for the air conditioning. And that just so happened was the money that they had budgeted for their food. So they said, well, it'll be okay. We'll still go on the cruise. We'll buy some cheese and crackers and some tuna and other things, and we'll keep it in the room. And so they went on the cruise, and for the first 13 days, they pretty much camped out in their room. They camped out because... They knew that they didn't have any extra money, so therefore they wasn't going to be able to afford to uh, go out to the restaurants in the ship or do other things in the ship, so they just stayed in their room. Finally, on the 13th day, the wife said you know, to her husband, she said, can we go tomorrow? Well, I know we have a little bit of money set aside. Can we at least, the last day of the cruise, let's go explore the ship and let's uh, have a dinner in the ship. So on that 14th day, they went out on the last day of their vacation, on the last day of their cruise, they went to one of the restaurants in the ship. Man, it was nice, fancy. The, the, the man come out in a tuxedo, the waiter, he had a towel over his arm. He was just, boy, it was everything was just laid out so nice. And, and so they begin to order their drinks and and then he opened the menu up, and he looks at the menu, and she says to her husband, as she's looking at the menu, she says, there's no prices. Anybody ever gone to a restaurant where there's no prices on the menu? Usually, if you go to a restaurant where there's no prices on the menu, that means you can't afford it. Okay? It just, you need to leave. Well, she, she gets real nervous because they don't have a lot of money, and, and so she says, why don't you ask the waiter when she, he comes back, you know, What's some of the meals and what's it going to the prices so we can know? And so the waiter came back and uh, the, the husband said to the waiter, he begins to explain to him. He said, look, sir, you know, for the last 13 days, we've been eating cheese and crackers in our room. And we wanted to have a nice meal this last day of the cruise. But we're on a tight budget because of our air conditioning breaking. And we just we we saved five years to go on this cruise and we're on a tight budget. So. We want to be able to have a meal, but there's no prices on the menu. And the waiter just literally started crying and sat down at the table with them. And he shook his head and he looked at them and they're like, what's wrong? He said, ma'am, sir, 
it's included with the cruise. When you bought your ticket to this ship, every restaurant, every store, you could walk in any of our stores and got whatever you wanted at no cost. It's all, this is an all-inclusive trip. You can order anything on this menu. Anytime. We're open 24-7. You could have got up at 2 o'clock in the morning and come down and got you a lobster. True story. Now, I shared that tonight because as I was praying today, I really feel that this is the same exact. Now, some of you are probably thinking, man, that was stunk. That stunk. You know, yeah, they were on the cruise, and yeah, they got to be on the same ship with everybody else, but they just didn't enjoy all the benefits that they could have enjoyed. I want to talk tonight about being in the church. I have watched so many people that call themselves children of God, that come to church faithfully, but I don't believe you're truly enjoying all the benefits uh, that God has for you. Amen. So I want to just preach tonight that God wants there to be, now let me rephrase that, God has established, uh, he has made it a law, he has established it since he began to make his people that there was supposed to be a difference between Egypt and Israel, between the world and the church, that God said there will be a difference somebody say amen i want to help you tonight maybe with this message that we would learn to grow to live in the fullest potential that god would have us to live in somebody say amen i like the old things we say the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away somebody say amen praise god I want to preface what I want to say here. I'm not saying that we won't go through hard times. I'm not saying that we won't experience sickness. We see that happening right now. Many are getting sick and they're going through sicknesses. But I am saying it is the desire and the will of God when the end of the story is written that the world will see that even though there was a period of pandemic, there was a difference about God's people and the rest of the world. God wants to write a different story. Amen. God wants to bless it. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, the Lord said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly now we understand now uh, as frustrating as it gets when i see backsliders who talk bad about the church and who elevate themselves and they they try to paint the picture like their life is so good and everything is so perfect in their life but i come to tell you it will not stay that way because the thief cometh not but for to kill to steal and to destroy they may have a season where it looks like everything's going good, but I'm telling you that's only a front. Because eventually when the devil's through, he destroys everything. But our God, he comes to build up. He comes to make things better. He comes to give us life and life more abundantly. God desires to give us abundant life. Somebody say amen. Amen. I just come to tell you, young people, don't be fooled by a backslider who thinks that they try to show everything's going good. In Psalm 73, the psalmist Asaph said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, it did bother me. You know, man, look at them. Looks like everything's going good in their life. But he said in verse 17, until I came to the sanctuary, until I found a place to pray, then I understood, wait a minute. 
I understand the end of the story. God has a plan for me. He's lifting me up while they're on slippery slopes. They're going to fall. What they have is going to be destroyed. But the church, there will be a difference between God's people and the world. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Someone say praise the Lord. God wants the church to be different. I'm talking this, this night, I'm preaching tonight, because I want to help some of you to change the way you're thinking. Come on, to change the way you're thinking, to get your attitude aligned with what God's trying to do. Amen. I Honestly, I'm trying to hold myself back because while I was studying and praying in my office every night, I was getting kind of excited because God was showing me how and what he wanted to do for you. For some that are not even here tonight who are faithful to the, to the church, God showed me if you'll step it up, if you'll step up with your attitude, if you'll step up with the way you're thinking, God wants to bless us because we're his people. And he wants there to be a defined difference. I'm not preaching about holiness tonight. That's a part of living for God. There should be an outward difference. There should be a difference in our attitude. But God wants to show a difference in our livelihood from the world and the church. I'm not preaching necessarily a prosperity message, but I'm talking about sonship. We are the children of the Most High God. We are the people of, I, I got a daddy who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's able to do anything. There's nothing too hard for my God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I want us to start acting like what we believe or like what we should believe. Somebody say amen. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. From the beginning of time, God decided to have a people. We know the story that in the beginning, God blessed the nation of Israel, Abraham's seed. He blessed Israel, and he said, whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse, that God was going to take care of the people of Israel. Somebody say amen. Now, we know history has gone through ups and downs with Israel, but let's just talk about Israel as a nation of today. Israel as a nation of today is one of the youngest nations in the world, beginning in 19. And 48, May of 1948, the United Nations and many other first world nations established that Israel was a new nation. Does anybody know what happened as soon as they did that? War. A war broke out. And all the nations around Israel attacked them. May of 1948. Here was a young fledgling nation that God said, you're going to know a difference between these people and the world. You're gonna, there, there will always be a difference between Israel and the rest of the world. Here they were. They didn't have an organized military. They didn't have the weaponry, the soldiers, none of that stuff. But just in a matter of months, they started conquering all the other nations around them. I'm going to tell you, if the United States and the United Nations had not have stepped in, there would not be an Egypt today. There would not have been a Lebanon today. There would not be an Iraq today. I'm not even saying that wouldn't have been so bad. But they found out real quick there's something different about these people. These are blessed people. Israel, in 1967, was again attacked by their surrounding nations is what we know as the Six-Day War in 1967. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon all organized secretly an attack from all sides at the very same time to overtake and to destroy Israel as a nation and turn it back over 
to Islamic countries and to Muslim countries. That was in 1967. Let me give you some of the numbers and bear with me tonight. There's a reason why I'm teaching this tonight. In 1967, these other nations, these five nations that attacked Israel, amassed 547,000 troops. Over half a million troops. A little over 1,000 military aircraft and 2,504 military tanks in an orchestrated, organized, surprise attack from all sides. Israel was attacked in 1967. At the time of the attack, Israel had 50,000 troops against 547,000 troops Israel only had 50,000 ground troops against the 1,000 military aircraft Israel only had in 1967 250 aircraft with the majority of those being leftovers that other countries had given up after World War II not modern not, not, not great technology. Against the 2,504 tanks, Israel had 800 tanks, many of them leftover Sherman tanks that America had given to them from World War II. So these were 20-year-old, 25-year-old tanks that Israel had in 1967 against over 2,500 tanks. They were outnumbered on every front. On every front, the entire world was shocked when Israel was attacked. And why do they call it a six-day war? Because in six days, Israel destroyed all five countries' armies. In six days, all five of those countries surrendered unconditionally. In six days. There are books written, stories written. You can read about what happened in those six days in 1967. One particular story that stood out to me was one of the Israeli tank commanders going into the, the uh, Sinai Peninsula, into the desert, going into an attack against Egyptian forces. He had with him 10 Israeli tanks and 100 ground soldiers, infantry soldiers with him going into an attack. They were spread thin because they had to spread out on all fronts. They were surrounded. Five nations were attacking them at the same time. Here was this Israeli tank commander, this child of God, the blood of God. You stay with me today. And he was going into the attack on the opposing hillside. Over the, the desert plumes came over 100 Egyptian tanks and a little over a thousand infantry soldier and supporting soldiers coming into the attack. Here they were with just 10 tanks and a hundred soldiers. They were outnumbered on every side. But right when the battle was about to commence, the Israelis were not backing down. They were not backing down. Here was a people who had gone through the Holocaust. Here was a people who finally got a nation. And they said, we will not back down. We will not bow. We, it doesn't matter how outnumbered we are. They said, we will not. We will not. We will not surrender. And so they put their tanks into Ford. And they loaded their guns. And their soldiers started marching. And to the Israelis' dismay, the Egyptian tanks stopped and they began to get out waving white flags. They were surrendering. So they said, put down your weapons. They threw down their weapons, and they laid in the sand. And the Israeli soldiers went and tied them all up, 1,000 soldiers, 100 tanks, and captured all of them. Later on, when they brought them in to interrogate and to investigate, and they got the commanding officer of the whole battlefield that day and said to the general, why in the world would you have surrendered on the battlefield? He said, what do you mean, why? He said, we had no choice. No, you outnumbered us 10 to 1. 
We had 10 tanks and 100 men. You had 100 tanks and 1,000 men. We, why? He said, no, no, no. Everyone they interviewed from the Egyptian side said, no, what we saw was 1,000 tanks and 10,000 men. And we saw Apache helicopters from America's forces. How, how did you get those helicopters? How did you get those? They were, those were new and advanced helicopters. They said, no, sir. They, they swore. They wrote affidavits. The reason they surrendered is because they were so outnumbered. God said, there will be a difference. You shall see. We may not see it. We may not understand it. It may look like we're struggling. It may look like we don't have all the money. But I come to tell you what the world's going to see is there is a difference with God's people and the world. There will be a difference. There are many other stories you can look in books where there were jet pilots from Egypt and from Lebanon and from all these other nations. And there were fighter pilots who were landing their planes and skidding out and refusing to go back in the air. Documented stories that said, we're not going back up or fighting. Why? He said, they said, because there's, there, there, there's, there's some sort of flying objects up there with flaming wings. And they're attacking us. Uh, and they're pushing us out of the sky. They, we've never seen planes like that. The entire wing. What they were seeing was Michael's angels say, no, that's my people. And there shall be a difference uh, between my people and the world. You, I'm going to tell you something. There are more with us uh, than there are with them greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world amen amen nation of israel a young nation since 1948 face facing many many attacks and constantly on guard the nation of israel has right now the highest life expectancy in the world Israel's life expectancy is over 81. The life expectancy in America is only 73. Israel is over 81. They're the highest in the world. In the nation of Israel in the last 40 years, they have planted more trees and created more forest than any other nation in the world combined. And we're not talking about in land like we have. We're talking about a desolate desert place that has been destroyed for millenniums. And they come in. And now where there were deserts in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s are lush forest of trees. Of, there's, there, there's apple trees and pear trees and there's peach trees in places where it was nothing but rock and desert. And I'm telling you something, just a few miles away in the Palestinian-controlled places, in the Egyptian and Lebanese-controlled places, it's still a desert. But just right across the border, there shall be a difference. There shall be a difference. Somebody say amen. The nation of Israel in the last decade, in the last 20 years, two decades, have produced more scientific discoveries, more medical science discoveries than all other nations combined. Everywhere. The chip that runs your cell phones was invented in Israel. All of your modern technology that you have today, you can trace all of its roots, not to Silicon Valley. No, it all goes back to Israel. There shall be a difference. Israel today has more NASDAQ traded country uh, companies than any other nation beside the United States of America. We're the only ones that have more than Israel, and Israel's just a tiny young nation since 1948. Somebody say amen. I could go on and on. I could tell you stories, and I love history. At the end of World War II, when they... American troops and the American GIs went into those concentration camps across Europe and freed those Jews. Many thousands of them who now were homeless, who now, some of them 
family members were gone, orphans and, and their wives and couldn't find husbands and husbands couldn't find their wives. This was a broken and a destitute people. Thousands of them were brought to our country, to America. There were places in America where they were set up more and more, and more notably understood and known about is the, the ghettos of New York City, the, the small borough that in New York City that in 19 late 1940s, many of these Holocaust survivors were brought in. You can find pictures of them living in these tenant houses and just getting jobs as laundry workers and as cleaners and street sweepers. And they were frail skin and bones. These Jewish people, these people of Israel, they were destitute. They were afflicted. But within a matter of one decade, in a matter of 10 years, Within 10 years of them being in New York City, from 1946, 1945, 1946, 1947, it is said by 1956, 1957, that those simple, poor Holocaust survivors now controlled 80% of banking in New York City within 10 years. Within 20 years, if your clothes was getting washed by a dry cleaner, it was owned by a Jew. Every business you walked into was owned or operated or partly owned by a Jew. They took over. And now when you look into American politics and American around us, they are blessed beyond measure. It's, 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 it's the children of Israel. And Pastor, how do, what does this have to do with us? Please, please stay with me. Because I'm just coming to tell you tonight, uh, the problem with us is we don't realize uh, who we are. Because the Bible says uh, that God has adopted us. Those who have taken on his name, those uh, who have obeyed his word uh, and have repented of their sins uh, according to Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 38. Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And God has said, I'm going to adopt you, whereby we can now cry, Abba, Father. So, the blessings that God promised to Israel are now laid at our feet too. Now, I understand adoption. We've adopted. Skyron's been adopted. Skyron's working tonight. I love her. But see, even now, Skyron struggles with understanding that what my biological children have, she has. She called me the other week on a Sunday and says, can I come over for lunch? And I got mad. Why are you asking? She got there, and I pulled her aside. Her and her, 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 my wife, her mom, we said, you should never, ever ask. You never have to ask. This house is yours. This home is yours. You're no different than any other of our children. But see, she still has the mindset that she's less of a person and less being blessed than what... And she's missing out. She's like that couple on the cruise ship. She's, she's down there satisfied with cheese and crackers when she could be up here eating lobster and steak. Come on, Gentiles. I'm just talking to the Rock Church today. We don't have to be satisfied with being less. When God has adopted us, we've got to change our mindset. Stop acting like that we're something that we're not. Somebody say amen. When the Jews go into a place, they automatically have the intent of, I'm going to own everything in this county. I'm going to take over everything. I'm going to do it. But what do we do? We come into a city, and we, we, we grow content with just being a day laborer. We're just, just eking it by through life and just struggling. 
What are you trying to preach tonight? I know there's a lot of people out, and I know a lot of people are going to see this. But I'm going to tell you, we have got to change our mindset. God has more for us. You can live down in the bottom of the ship, or you can live up on the top. I'm just telling you, we got a choice. God said, I've, I've adopted you. Come on, you got the blood. We sing the song the children sang it Sunday. Father Abraham has many sons. I am one of them, and so are you. But we sing it, but we don't believe it. We sing it, but we don't live it. I'm, I'm trying to tell us we got to change the way we think. we got to change the way our mindset is. We are spiritual Israel. The blood of Abraham now is for us. <laughs> My wife, she's often laughed at me because I feel like I own everything. I don't worry about nothing. Every place I go, I walk in with confidence. I am not intimidated by anybody. Why? Because I realized a long time ago, I'm a child of the Most High God. That's right. I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm, I'm, I'm a seed of Abraham. And the blessings that God promised to Israel, God's given it to me. You say, well, why did Israel have to go through much, so much pain and suffering? I'll tell you why. It's because Israel backslid. And when a church backslides in their heart, they set themselves up for God to teach them a lesson for what kind of good father would not chastise his children. And they put themselves under the hand of other people, and they, they, them people begin to hurt them and destroy them. But when Israel wakes up and says, wait a minute, we are the people of God, that's every time that they do that, God bless them. So, Pastor, you're telling me that it's really about my attitude? 95% of it's about your attitude. Only 5% of it is about what you do. It's all about our attitude. It's how we think. It's how we view ourselves. It's how we operate. It's how we wake up in the morning. It's how we, we put our chest out realizing, wait a minute. I'm a, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm blessed. Brother Lance, get you a mic and get you a, a Bible. And uh, get ready. I'm going to have you read me a scripture here in a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And... Uh, I've, I've, I've skipped over so much because time doesn't permit me. I, uh, the children's church will kill me if I preach everything I have up here tonight. But if, 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 if I could just digress to get you to buy into what I'm talking about, I believe that God will show you that he wants to bless you. That God will show you that he wants to give you the kingdom. That, that the city of Morganton, they, they need to see the difference between the church, the real church, and the rest of the world. There will be a difference between Israel and Egypt. There is a difference. The question is, are you willing to walk in it? Not just in your holiness, not just, I'm not even preaching about that tonight. I'm just saying that should be what you already do. We're already God's people. We're already set apart. But I'm talking about really walking in what God wants us to have. I, I was praying in my office this afternoon. I felt a spirit of prophecy while I was praying. I feel a spirit of prophecy that God wants me to prophesy to this church about the future of this church and the future of some of you that will buy into what God's wanting to do. That will buy into what God, and, and will stop living by fear and start living by faith. I may be the tail right now, but that's not what God called me to be. He called me to be the head. I may owe money right now, but that's not what God's called me. I will be debt free. As a matter of fact, I will own more than I've ever owned. I will be blessed. The world will see that there is a difference between God's people and the rest of them. Somebody say amen. Deuteronomy chapter 28, Brother Lance, verse number 1. Read it loud and clear for me. And it shall com come to pass, if thou shalt... If. Everybody say if. If. Notice there's a condition here. We have to do something. Read. If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, uh -huh. to observe and to do all... His commandments. We got we to observe and do all his commandments. We are a Bible believing people. Read. Which I command thee this day yeah. that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. I want you to understand, church, this promise to Israel is a promise to the spiritual Israel today as well. This is a promise for the church. Yeah. Read. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou sh shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, 
Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shall we be in the city. Read. And blessed shalt thou be in the field. And blessed shall we be in the countryside. Read. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground. Blessed are going to be our children. And blessed are going to be every business that we start. Go ahead. And the fruit of the cattle, the increase of the kine, and the flocks of the sheep. Read. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Uh -huh. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. When we come in. And blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. And when we go out. Notice that prayer we do before our offering. Because we're praying what God had promised to us. Read. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Oh, they'll attack you one way, but when they see God and what he's doing in your life, they're going to run seven directions to get away from you. Read. The Lord shall command thee blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. Yes, and in he said, I'm going to command blessings on you. My God, my God, read. And in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. He said, all your hands put to, I'm going to bless it. See, some of us are afraid to put our hands to things because we're sitting around waiting. Well, is it the will of God? But the Bible says, he said, everything you touch, yeah. if, you'll com if you'll obey my commandments, I'm going to tell you, this is a blessed church, but we're not living in our blessings. Why? Because we're too afraid to put our hands to stuff. We're too afraid to try new stuff. We're too afraid to say, you know what, and take a risk because we want to live so so in fear and so back here and backward. You say, well, I can't. Here's what I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to stop there. We could read on all the way down through that whole passage there. And the Bible says that the world will be afraid of us. They'll be afraid of us. They, 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 will, they will look at us and say, there's something different about them. My title tonight is There Is a Difference, and it's time for everybody to start seeing it. But the only way they're going to see it is if we start living in it. I'm reminded, Brother Mark Copeland preached something similar to this several years ago. He talked and testified about his church. And Sebastopol, Sebastopol, I don't even know how to say it. Mississippi. If you Google it, Google can't even find it. It is out in the middle of nowhere. But if you get out to Sebastopol, Mississippi, if you can find it, the closest, when I understand, the closest hotel is 45 minutes away. But out in the middle of the swamp, Small community of Sebastopol, you'll find a church that seats over 1,200 people. A beautiful sanctuary, a massive church, a massive church choir. And a, so just kind of bring things in perspective, it's where Sister Narlock's from, Sister Nina Narlock. That's her home church, Sebastopol, Mississippi, out in the middle of nowhere. That's where she got in church. That's where she's out of. That's Brother, Brother Narlock's pastor, Brother Copeland. And they are a blessed church. He said, but several years ago, they were in a small building, and they were struggling. And they, he said, we were raising money for a water fountain. We, it was a, a $1,000 water fountain, and it seemed so big to us. Like, oh, we're going to. And he said, and God woke me up one night and said, do you want to be remembered as the peanut brittle church? Or do you want to be remembered as God's church? You say, Pastor, why don't we do a bunch more fundraisers? I hate fundraisers. The Bible says the money is in the fish's mouth. I don't mind us raising money. I mean, the, the Bible quiz team is going to do some dinners after church on Sunday nights and sell some plates of food, and that's going to help their, 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 their Bible quiz team. And I don't mind Sunday school doing some things. But I'm just coming to tell you, I believe if we will truly learn to live in what God has called us to live in, we'll never have to have a fundraiser. We'll never have to struggle because God says, I want to bless you. Everything your hand touches Come on, God wants to bless your finances and then you give the finances to the church and you bless the church. God wants to increase what you have because you've been faithful. You've been faithful with your 10% and your offerings. I just come to tell you, why don't you open your eyes and look around? God's going to bless you more in the year rest of 2020. I felt this in the Holy Ghost today. 
There are businesses that God wants some of the people in this church to step out in faith and start, but we're so afraid. Some of you wives need to shut up. You're the voice of negativity, and God wants to bless your home, and God wants to turn your husband into a millionaire, but your fear is keeping your family broke. Your fear is keeping the man of God in your home from taking a step because he wants you to be happy, and he wants you to support what he's trying to do. And I'm telling you, you're the reason why you're struggling. If you would change your attitude and get behind your husband and say, Honey, whatever your hand touches, you just know, I don't care if we live in a box, I'm going to be behind you supporting you. If you decide to start 10 companies, I'm going to be behind you and supporting you. I'm going to support what you're doing because I believe what the pastor is saying. There will be a difference there will be a difference there will be a difference brother Jonathan I come to tell you they're going to see a difference when they, God begins to really bless your restaurant in this coming year there will be a difference somebody say amen he said so he took a set of faith he said forget the water fountain we're going to build a new church so they built a new church had a $10,000 mortgage $10,000 a month mortgage. Man, whew. Man, that's with them paying for a lot of it. God gave them the money. He said, but God began to bless people in his church. One of those rednecks from the backwoods of Mississippi who was a truck driver. Brother Copeland came to him and said, you know what? It's time for you to stop working for everybody else. It's time for you to start taking a step of faith and start working for yourself. In a matter of nine months, went from being a truck driver for some other people to having 17 trucks of his own out on the road with his own company, being blessed, walking in favor, taking steps of faith and trust in God, being faithful in his giving, being faithful in his tithing and offerings to God. I just want you to understand that I am not talking to those who don't pay tithes. Because if you don't pay, if you don't give your tithes and offering, I'm, you, you, you've just put yourself outside of the adoption. Because the Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Come on. I'm talking to the church today. I'm preaching to the church that God wants to elevate and bless you. Samantha, all those years where you and Nick have been faithful, I'm telling you, it's coming back on y'all. And God's going to bless you. But God's going to open a door. I'm believing this in the Holy Ghost for Brother Nick to have his own company. Brother Nick stood in my house a few few months ago when we were in Mono, about a year ago. He said, I want to have my own company doing my own specialty tile business. What's wrong? Why don't he just go ahead and let's pray for Brother Nick right now that God would open the door right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, they have been faithful and given to the church. Uh, he's sick right now. But God, I believe you're going to open the door. The world says a deaf man can't own a business, uh, but he's one of yours. Uh, and there shall be a difference in the name of Jesus. Oh, yo, no, no. Let's clap your hands to the Lord. I feel that in the Holy Ghost. I feel that in the Holy Ghost. I feel that in the Holy Ghost. The house they're living in, they'll have 10 of those houses just like that renting in 20 years. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm talking you. God said there shall be a difference. It's time for us to get out of the cabin and get out for our cheese and crackers and walk up to where God says, wait a minute, this has all been paid for. I already bought this with my blood. Come on. I'm telling some of you, it's time for you and your husband, you and your spouse, your wife, to get in the car and start driving through some neighborhoods looking at houses. I'm just preaching when I feel the Holy Ghost. I said it's time for you to go start looking at some houses. Go drive by the lake at South Point. So you know what? We're going to have a house like that right there. Get out of your cheese and cracker mentality. Well, Dave Ramsey said, forget Dave Ramsey. I'm not saying he's wrong. But you better get off of this holding back from risk. Because God's people has always been tested by taking risk. And if you follow Dave Ramsey, you'll never take a risk. You may get out of debt, but you'll never take a risk. Am I right? You'll always be down in cheese and crackers. You'll always be down struggling. I'm not saying, well, Pastor, you're saying I should go get in debt. You may go get in debt. You may have to go out and get a million dollars of debt and blow your mind, and it's exactly what God wants you to do. Because God wants you to take a step. And he says, everything you touch, I'm going to bless it. 
Well, Dave Ramsey said, oh, no man, nothing. You're, that's out of context. That's in Romans chapter 13, and that was written to the preacher. It wasn't written to you. It was written to the preacher for him to take no bribes from nobody so that when he gets in the pulpit, he don't owe anybody nothing but the word of God, undefiled, preached, unadulterated. You better put things in context. The Bible doesn't teach that you don't have debts, that you don't take risk. But the Bible teaches that there will be a difference in what you do and what the world does. And that when the, when the risk comes into fruition, that what we have will prosper. I know I'm going against Ramsey tech theology, but it'll, it'll be all right. There shall be a risk, but there shall be a blessing. He said that man that started that trucking company called him a few months into that new church building. He said, Pastor... I'm buying X amount more trucks, and I just want you to know, from here on out, I don't know the name of the trucking company, but the, my trucking company, above my tithe, is going to pay the church mortgage. And that church hasn't had to pay a mortgage payment yet because that trucking company has paid the church payment every month, every month, paid the church payment and almost paid it off. There shall be a difference. We are a special people, a royal priesthood. I'm preaching to the Rock Church. It's time to get out of our cheese and crackers mentality. God's already paid the price. This message just, I'm going to, you'll hear me preach a lot of this. I felt this in prayer this week. And I'm in fasting, my wife's been doing it. In fasting, I've done, I have felt that God wants us to step out and really open our eyes and understand what he can do. Look at this church. If you look at our finances and look over the last 10 years of our finances, there is no way in man's math that we should have a whole school, a whole restaurant, a softball p- field, and even a tent that has no air conditioning, and all these chairs and this PA equipment. It doesn't add up. The math is just not there. I tell you why we have what we have. It's because a few of you have bought into your crazy pastor that just believe that God can do anything. And you're just, well, I'm following, Pastor. I'm following. But what I'm trying to preach to you, it's time for you to stop just following. I want you to branch out and say, I'm going to give my blessing. I'm going to walk in what God's called me to have. I'm going to walk in the sonship. I'm not just going to let Pastor sit up there and eat that meal. I'm going to put my cheese and crackers up, and I'm going to go get me a lobster too. (laughs) Somebody say amen. Amen. Come on, it's time for us to change our mentality over our prayers. We're going to have fasting next week, and we're going to pray and fast, and we got to change our mentality. we got to fast. God, show me the opportunity you're trying to place before me. You see, when the Jews went into New York City, they may have been in the ghetto. They may have been in tenement housing. They may have been skin and bones, uh, but they walked in by faith knowing, wait a minute. You see that big, tall bank? Uh, in a few years, it's going to be my name on that building. They believed it, and they walked in it. It's time for us to start believing and walking in it. This is the type of preaching that Brother Holmes has built the church in Little Rock off of. He has preached sonship, sonship preaching, that we are the sons and daughters of the Most High God, and why shouldn't we be the most blessed people of God? If we will put things in order, God will bless it. This is a church that loves your pastor. I know that. I love you, but I know you love me, and you put up with me, and I preach hard sometimes, and sometimes it sounds crazy, but yet you keep coming back. And you're submitted, and you want to be submitted, and I appreciate that. And that's the first step, because I'm telling you, if you'll stay, and you'll just step out and start trusting, God's going to do something. God's going to open doors. You say, well, I, I just don't see myself being a business owner. See, that's the problem. You're looking through your eyes of who you are and not realizing, wait a minute, I need to look through daddy's eyes. Don't feel bad. You're not the first one. Gehazi did it. When Gehazi looked out the tent, and all he saw was the thousands of enemy that surrounded them. And the man of God was over there having breakfast, chilling out. He's like, Elisha, we're going to die. He's nah, man, chill out. Why are you eating? Why why aren't you stressed out? Why aren't you worried? (laughs) Because I'm a son of a most high. Everything that I touch, God's going to take care of. 
the weapon may be formed, but it shall not prosper. And so the, the man of God prayed over the servant and said, Lord, let him have eyes that he may see. Let him stop seeing through his carnal eyes and see through spiritual eyes. Romans chapter 8, come on. And when he looked out the second time, he's like, oh, okay. He saw 10,000 fiery chariots uh, and all the angels of heaven surrounding the enemy and realized uh, there are more with us uh, than there are with them, uh, that we are a chosen people. There shall be a difference. We got some young men in this church that are going to start some businesses. I believe in this room, in this tent, without air conditioning, my God, and it's hot, and we've been miserable. We've been having church. But I believe under this tent tonight, and even those watching, we have 10 to 15 millionaires in this church in the next 10 years. Millionaires. You know where the money is for us to buy new buses? It's in you. The money's in the fish's mouth. It's in the potential God's given you because you've been faithful. You've been faithful in little. God wants to give you more. But the problem is you can't give more because you don't have more to give because you're down there eating your cheese and crackers not realizing that God has more to give you up here. Are y'all catching what I'm pitching tonight? <laughs> you see what I feel? I feel a connection happening in the Holy Ghost and somebody's faith is starting to rise. Yeah, maybe, maybe why I've been going through what I've been going through is because God's trying to set me up for a blessing. That's exactly what God's been doing. God's been setting you up for the last 10 years. God's been setting some of you up for the last 15 to 20 years to put you right where he wants you so that he can pour out a blessing on you so that the world, so that family members who have mocked you, so that people who have laughed at you, so that people who have made fun of you, they shall see there is a difference. Somebody ought to run the aisles right now. If you believe what I'm preaching. Someone say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants businesses started in this church. God wants companies started in this church. I believe I was praying the other day and God showed me that there's several in here that had the potential to be in real estate, to buy, sell real estate, step out by faith, to go deeper than you've ever been before, to stop discouraging those around you. Don't be the one that's still down there eating cheese and crackers when we're all up here having a steak and lobster. Come on. When it's already been paid for, God already purchased your blessing. God's already purchased your miracle. He's just waiting for you to change your mentality. He's waiting for you to change the way you pray. We sit around begging God for something he's already paid for. We're sitting around looking for the price tag when God said there's no price tag because I've already taken care of it. I am not intimidated by any price tag the world may throw in front of us because God's already taken care of it. He's already going to make a way. I don't know how. I don't know where. But I know he will. Well, Pastor, I'm living in government house and and I have to have assistance for food. It shall not be that way forever. Lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing nigh. There's a couple, and I, time doesn't happen. It doesn't permit me to give all the stories and testimonies, but the North Little Rock Church, First Pentecostal Church for the Holmes Church, Pastor Holmes preached for us last year. But his church built a $34 million sanctuary a few years ago. $34 million sanctuary. Not, not, well, I, was, I had somebody say, well, why in the world? That's a waste of money. Why don't you tell it to the 30 or 40 millionaires in there that a few years ago were broken, destitute, but followed the man of God, bought into the vision, and started companies and stayed faithful. And some of them stayed working where God sent them to work. And everybody laughed because they stayed there working. But now they own the company because the owner saw them and said, you know what? I like you, and I'm not giving this to my son. I'm giving this to you. And they were given businesses. They were given companies. They were lifted up. There was a difference, and there shall be a difference between God's people and the world. When God's people learns to live and walk by faith and trust God in what he's doing. One family bought into Brother Holmes' vision, and, and they, the, their testimony, they got a series, an entrepreneur series that you can order from their church. It's all testimonies of people in that church who bought into vision. Some of them 
uh, worked for companies that now they own the company. Some of them uh, did different paths. Not everybody had the same path. They, they trusted what the man of God told them, and they went out by faith and began to do things. Some of them started little companies where they just made things, but they were faithful. One common denominator amongst all of them is they were faithful in a little. They were given 10% when they didn't have a lot. I had someone tell me a few years ago, if I win the lottery, I'm going to pay tithes. I said, I ain't holding my breath. Because you ain't paid tithes on $10, why would I think you'll pay tithes on $100 million? He who is faithful in the least shall be rewarded with greater. So I'm talking to you. These same people, they were faithful in little. And this one, this man, this woman, they are country as cornbread. When you hear them testify, I'll try to get some of the CDs and pass around. And that you hear them testify, he sounds like a backwood Morgantonian. Or MacDowell. I mean, they were country. He's like, I'll tell you, Pastor said for us to go out and take a step of faith. So we start, we took our savings, and we had saved up for vacation. I wanted to buy a bass boat, but instead, I, Pastor said, don't buy a bass boat. Go out and buy a piece of property. He said, so we went out, and we were going to be real estate agents. Everybody probably thought, these people are crazy. But what they did not realize, there shall be a difference. He said the first house we bought was $10,000. It's a little wooden frame house. wasn't worth much. It was just a piece. It, it had an older black lady living in it who had been paying rent. She was paying $200 a month, had been paying $200 a month for years. He said we bought the house and made our mind up. We wasn't going to raise her rent. As long as she lived there, she would have the same rent. It was going to be our first investment. And so they bought that house. And for the, it, it, I think she lived for another 10 years, and she only paid $200 a month. They wasn't really making a lot off that investment, but they were being obedient to what the man of God said do, and they took a step of faith. And they began, another door opened up, and they were able to buy another piece of property and another piece of property. And he said then, then they bought God told him they had, they had started making some money after about five years in the real estate business. They were starting to make some money, and they had sold some property, and, and they had a little bit of change, you know, a little, a little bit of money set aside. I want to say it was like $170,000 in their savings account in five years. And this you know, sounds like a lot, but any of us that know money, that's not a lot of money. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, the Lord began to deal with him about buying an old shut-down factory on the outskirts of town. That had been for sale, I want to say for eight years, and it had been for sale for eight years for nearly, I think, $5.6 million. It's been for sale for eight years. And they went to his pastor and he said, I really feel that pray with me that I'm going to take this step of faith and we're going to buy this property. God told me to offer $1.2 million. He didn't have $1.2 million, he had $170,000 in the bank. He had him and another guy in his church had partnered up and they went to their banker and they convinced the banker. To be able to see, look, if we can get them to accept $1.2 million, will you give us the loan? And it was like biting teeth, you know. Here they were, just five years earlier, barely able to scrum $10,000 together to buy their first piece of property. And now they're sitting at the bank asking the bank for $1.2 million with only $170,000 in the bank. With no prior business dealings of anything like this. And the banker said, I'll do it. That's God math. Are you with me? That's God math. And so they took a step of faith, and they went out, and they offered the $1.2 million, and to their amazement, the company was so ready to sell, they sold them the property. The, so the first day he went out to the property, here's this huge, I want to say several hundred thousand square foot. Some of you remember the old Drexel Heritage plants around here? They were selling for nothing a few years ago, and they nobody's made money off of it. But here he was. People don't want to touch these old buildings because of asbestos, because of all the all the stuff that's in there. And here he was standing here with over two hundred thousand square foot of real estate or, or, or real estate space, and uh, what's he going to do with it? And his wife, she, she said later, said I thought he was crazy, but the man of God told me to get behind my husband and support him, and it was going to be okay. So we're going to take a step of faith. There shall be a difference. 
The first day he goes to get his keys, he arrives at the, uh, and I'm getting the story as close as I can. I've listened to it several times. I, I may bring the guy in just to tell you the testimony so you can hear it from his own lips. He said, we got there, and the security guard was cleaning out his office because the previous owners had hired a security guard to be there. We, we couldn't afford a security guard. We had done put all our money into the basket. And the security guard, as he's cleaning out his office, said, oh, by the way, sir, here's two business cards or three business cards these men had been trying to call to buy some of the old equipment. The place was full of all kind of rusted and unused factory machinery. He said, I don't even know what it was for. All these huge machines everywhere just stacked up and still there from the previous tenants. And he said they wanted to buy some of the equipment. So he, that night he got on the phone. He called the first guy. He said, I'm the new owner. He said, I wanted to see if you want to buy equipment. He says, man, I've been calling for six months and nobody's returned my call. Yeah, I want to buy some of the equipment there. Okay, well, he said, give me a number. Here he is. He has no idea. He, you know, the guy says, I, I was going to offer the last guy $600,000 for the equipment. I'll call you back. He called the next guy. He said, I'm calling all three. Before it was over with, he had a bidding war, and he sold all the old, unused, rusted equipment for $850,000. The man says, I will have it, the, the, the uh, cashier's check in the mail tomorrow, and my company trucks will be there next week to start picking up the equipment. He said, Within three days of closing on the loan for $1.2 million with only $170,000 in the bank, he said, I'm walking back in the bank with an $850,000 check to pay off a, a, a big portion of that loan. You're talking about a happy bank, but you're really talking about a happy man of God. He said, my God, I was feeling real good. Here we are. And, I, and God wasn't done because the next week when the truck started arriving there and the man starts hauling out all this equipment, buying all this equipment, he comes to, uh, he comes to the man. He says, sir, he said, I want to talk to you. There's, uh, there's one piece of equipment. It, was, it would probably fit this tent the size of he described. It was a huge piece of equipment in part of the building. He said, I don't have a place to put this particular machine at the time. He said, but I still want it. I've paid for it. I want it. He said, but I have nowhere to put it in any of my factories. Would it be okay if I just rent where it's sitting until I come pick it up? He said, yeah, how much? Well, just give me a number how much you want to rent that space for. He said, I think $5,000 a month would be fair. He said, I'll hold, he said, I'm trying not to smile. I'm trying not to look like an idiot. You know, he said, oh, yeah, I think that that would be adequate. And then when I heard him tell this testimony, he said it's been five years. He still hasn't picked it up, and he hasn't missed a $5,000 a month payment in five years renting that one room in that big old empty factory. And it didn't stop there. He said, he said, then I called one of the other brothers in the church that does scrap metal. I said, I, I was going to hire a different company to come, and they were going to charge me, I think it was nearly $100,000 to come in and scrap the metal from there, and maybe I'll get something out of it. He said, that's crazy. He said, but there's a lot of old scrap metal pipes and stuff in this building we don't need in here. He said, I'm just going to turn it into a storage facility. And so the several guys in the church, he was paying $20 an hour to come in there and work 40 hours a week to bring out the metal and stack it up. He said, it blew my mind when it was all said and done, three and a half weeks later, all the metal was brought out of the building. It was $176,000 in scrap metal he said in a matter of two months we had paid off our loan and we were starting to make five thousand dollars a month profit already there shall be a difference and then the lord told him he said give the rest of the give half the building to the church and so he ended up giving half that building to the church, the Little Rock Church, to store all their props from all their Christmas and Easter plays and all their stuff they do. And so it, you, you may not understand how much storage a church has to have. Trust me, we got more junk than we know what to do with. Most of it we need. We just don't know where to put it. And so the church has over 100,000 100, square foot of storage space over there. The rest of it he's leased out for other rental space for storage. And it's making, I think, $25,000, $30,000 a month of just pure profit every month just coming into his business of a piece of property. He doesn't have to do anything but just have open. Doesn't have to have climate control because they don't need it. It's just storage. Then another piece of property. Now, he said every property hadn't been this way. But he said God has blessed them. They're, they are multimillionaires now. These hillbillies. 
who were working in, what happened? They lost their job. He lost his job at the factory he was working at. Went to his pastor, and his pastor, what do I do? The pastor said, God's going to open a door, and you're going to have to take a step of faith when he opens a door, because there shall be a difference. And he took that step of faith. He said several years later, there was another piece of property that they had split and sold. But when they had split it, in the corner, there was four acres that nobody wanted. So they just pretty much forgot about it. It was four acres he owned off, in a, uh, off the interstate a little bit, kind of off the side of town. And it, you know, it was an industrial area. He couldn't build a house there. And so he gets a call one day in his office. He's sitting up in his office, and he gets a phone call. Is this okay? Can I, am I helping you folks? I want to help you. And the phone call said, uh, it was a company, a, a California number, and said, I have a client who is looking for some property in North Little Rock. I'm not disclosing my client's name, but we're looking for a, a piece of property. Uh, it doesn't have to have anything on it, and it's going to be used for a type of storage. He had a check in his spirit. He really felt like God said, Tell them you're going to call them back. Pray about this. He said, look, I'll call you back. And then he felt like he should give them a price per square foot of the property, not by the acre. You know, he said there's something about this. He just So he gave them some astronomical number to rent, to lease this piece of property. I want to say it was four acres empty, nothing on it, nothing on it. And he said, I'll, I'll lease it to you by the square foot. It came out to a little, I think, $12,000 a month for nothing. And they're in Arkansas. If you know anything about Arkansas, Arkansas is a poor area. But you know what? It doesn't matter the economy around us. When you're God's people, there shall be a difference. There shall be a difference. So he called him back, and he told him that astronomical number, and he said, we'll take it. It ended up that it was Amazon. It was Jeff Bezos' country, the company, and they needed to fence it in for their Amazon trucks that they were going to be moving up. And Ar Little, Little Rock was kind of a hub, and they just needed a place for truckers to pull in, take a nap, have a little guard shack there, a fenced-in lot so they could sit in their trucks to their next delivery. That's all it was. And they were paying him $12,500 a month for that. And then any improvements that they did were permanent, had to stay. A few months later, they called back and said, you got any more? He said, two more acres. And he did it for five, I think, right at $5,500 a month. And he had nothing in it. It was just, it's living in the overflow. It's learning that if God's before us, who can be against us? I want to tell this people today, and for those that are watching, God wants to take the Rock Church away from our cheese and crackers mentality and elevate us up to what he's already paid for and what he wants to give us and what he wants to do. And some of you have already seen it. Sister Belva, 10 years ago, you'd have never imagined you'd have a house of your own, a new Jeep. But God's not done. It's only just begun. God said, I want to give you life, but life more abundantly. Well, I just lost my job. Hallelujah. I just got laid off. Praise God. The devil thinks that's a letdown, but that's a, no, to God, it's a set up. God's about to do something. He wants to do something great. Why don't we stand here tonight? Praise the Lord. I've gone too long. Let's lift our hands and let's thank God for what he's done. And let's pray a prayer that we will receive what God wants to give the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for what you're doing. For those that are listening and for those that are going to hear later, God, that we would rise from our cheese and, Lord, and cracker mentality and we would receive what you're trying to do. That the blessings, uh, the new buses, uh, the missionaries that are going to come out of the church, they're going to be funded by this church uh, and by the people of this church. Uh, God, we're not going to have to beg uh, because I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seat begging bread. God, I pray for the people of God to realize their sonship and the, who they are in Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Go and be blessed.